All right, so welcome to a quick lecture on the idea of pressure, temperature, volume, and the conversions between them. Um, this is the start of another chapter called Gas Laws, and frankly, it's a lot easier than what we just did. Um, this is an algebra chapter. It's an idea chapter. It doesn't have any really terrible math in it in the way that some of our other stuff has done. I find this chapter more interesting than a lot of what we do because it's closer to my, my true passions. In the background, you'll see an egg sauce station there that I helped stall. So that's what measures the weather at an airport and make sure that's okay for your plane to take off and stuff like that. Um, and those things aren't very good at measuring in every unit. And yet, you know, we talk about Fahrenheit and centigrade. We talk about things like millibar and hectopascal and pascal and all these different units. And we need some instruments that can talk between them. And I want to teach you today how to translate, basically. So the good news is this is a relatively straightforward thing. It's just a unit translation. Okay. So I'm going to move myself out of the way here a little bit, and I'll probably move around. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is talk about pressure. Now, you do have one of these things in front of you, and I will be very clear. You're going to be graded on whether or not you did it. So fill in the notes. If you need to like pause me to get the notes in, that's fine. That's the beauty of a video, after all. Um, but make sure you do have written down. I've tried to highlight in yellow the things that really matter here, but I might I, I miss some of it. So the first thing I want to do is talk about pressure. Pressure is the force per unit area. Force per unit area, that's pressure. It's kind of like how hard is the gas pushing on its container. And we're going to learn that containers have a lot of different definitions. Uh, simultaneously, the metric unit of pressure is what's called the Pascal, which has the unit symbol of PA. So I'm looking kind of in here at the Pascal. You'll comment, right? Look at that. That's nifty. Now, PA, Pascals, and it's named for some guy, Blaise Pascal, whatever. Uh, Pascals are small, a newton per square meter. We don't know what that really means. It's just a Pascal. So on your first notes there, force per unit area and Pascal. Now, a Pascal is actually a terrible measurement. I don't know if I've ever used one in practical fluid mechanics besides just a, well, here's an extra step. Uh, this baguette up here weighs 100 grams. Around this dog here is a square meter. And so if I put that baguette inside of that square, like erase the dog and put a baguette in there, the, the force across that whole area of floor from the weight of that baguette would be a, about a pascal. It's, it's nothing. You would, you would not feel it. Like imagine if you've got that plate balance like on your chest and I put a baguette on it, you're not going to feel the difference. And that's a pascal. It's a, it's a terribly small number. Um, so it's, it's not very good, and yet it's our SI unit. So we're going to need some way of translating between these Pascals and another unit. Okay, on your sheet here, I've asked you to write down the six different kinds of units. And here they are. We have the atmosphere, which is my favorite, because it's how many Earth atmospheres at sea level is one pressure unit. It's a really easy to understand. So if I say 100 atmospheres, you're like, whoa, that's a ton of pressure. Or a 20th of an atmosphere, you're like, no, that's not very much pressure. Okay, it's easy to understand. It makes sense. It, it's logical. Unfortunately, it's also not that commonly used at the moment. Uh, much more commonly used is still MMHG. So uh, we'll, lock, we'll talk about what MMHG means in a moment. But right now, it's just the millimeters of actual mercury, like the element mercury. There's the pounds per square inch, like your tires in your car, your bike, or your football. PSI, most of us are pretty familiar with. There's the tor and the bar, which sound ridiculously made up. Those are different. And then there's the millibar, which is confusingly not actually related to the bar at all. It's not like it's a thousandth of a bar. It's actually equal to a hectopascals because, you know, screw you. Um, when it comes down to it, there's way too many units. And one of the reasons why there's so many units here is because this was something we knew about a long time ago. And so we had a French group and a German group and an English group. All these people were studying pressure at the same time, and they were coming up with different ways of measuring it, you know, be it the French or the Italians or the whatever. And so that does throw us in a little bit of a loop here because we've got to figure out exactly which units are useful to us in chemistry. It's going to change problem to problem which one's actually useful. So make sure you've got these different units written down. And go ahead and pause me if you need to. But I'm going to keep going. Um, as you can see, even in day-to-day -day life, this is a air gauge on a uh, helium tank we used to fill up our weather balloon, actually. And you can see that, like, here's our PSI here. You can see the PSI goes up way high to 4,000. And outside here, here's thousands of pascals and 28,000 pascals. 
And you can see like it's doing the conversions right there on the dial. And like here's a barometer and it looks like on the outside it looks like I've got hectopascals or millibar. On the inside I've got MHG. Just on day-to-day -day life, lots of things contain multiple amounts of pressure units. So being able to convert between them is something that's useful to us because sometimes we're kind of just looking at it. kind of like miles per hour and kilometers per hour in your speedometer or something. Like, you don't know, really look at the one except the one that makes sense to you, but the one that makes sense to you may not always be there. By the way, we actually have a really good barometer here at Rockhurst. Um, if you ever want, you can log into this website, rhswx.rockhursths.edu. Uh, this picture I took with a drone up on our roof of it when I was inspecting it last time it snowed. It's been a little bit of time now. I um, probably need to check it again. Uh, it's, a, it's a full weather station up there. It tells you what's going on. Like It'll tell you what the highest and the coldest it's been. Now, obviously, this data over here is not from this month. You can look, it's from 2017. It's labeled, but besides the point, you can see one thing meteorologically that I'm interested in is the barometer. What's the highest pressure and the lowest pressure, right? And so if you want, you can come in and you can see like yearly data, weekly data, monthly data, whatever. What you're actually after here, though, is what I want you to see, which is... The pressure here at Rockers changes. It's high and low. When it's high, it tends to be kind of sunny, and when it's low, it tends to be kind of stormy. Um, this last weekend, it got very cold, and our pressure actually rose, which is weird. And they keep like a trace of what's going on because the pressure is rising and fall is effectively weather. Uh, and if it seems really tangent to the chemistry, it's not because chemical reactions depend on pressure too. Um, certain chemical reactions can only happen in a vacuum or uh, can't happen in a vacuum if they like highly pressurize them. And so when we're working with this, we're really talking about uh, something that can be useful to us, which is how do we deal with gases in a chem lab, which we haven't yet. Now, I want to point out, if nothing else, that you need to know what the instrument that's called that measures this is. And that's called the barometer. Barometer, B-A-R-O meter, M-E-T-E-R. The barometer is what measures pressure. And the first guy to make a barometer, at least one that worked was this guy Evangelista Torricelli. He's an Italian. He lives well before the United States is founded. And that barometer was made using mercury. And I want to point out his design was actually really good. It was actually so good that when I was studying atmospheric science, it was still a Torricellian barometer, this, this design of barometer that was actually used in our lab. And actually the very first thing I had to do was carry a tank of mercury up and down an elevator and figure out how tall the building was. Was that accurate? That could measure heights on the scale of buildings with it. Um, on the other hand, it's also mercury. Anyway, here's how a torus cell and barometer works. And on here, I want to make sure you're clear. Like, torus cell was one of the first to make a barometer. He used mercury, like the element, mercury. Wow. So you've got this tube, and the tube is a vacuum. There's no air in it. And you stick the vacuum tube with a hole down in mercury. So the only thing it can do is suck mercury in. because Not because a vacuum sucks. A vacuum doesn't suck. A vacuum allows something to be pushed into itself. So when you're sucking on a straw, you're not actually sucking on a straw. It's not your, your suction that's pulling the liquid in. What's, what's happening is the air is pushing the liquid into your body, uh, which is a bit of semantics that really doesn't matter that much. Now, as we're working with this, I've got my, my vacuum, I put it in mercury, and the air is pushing down and shoving the mercury up to a light. And if I measure like the height at the top and the height at the bottom, then the delta Z, the height of that column, is my pressure. Or I, it's correlated to my pressure, and I can make a unit defined on it, which is what Torricelli did. See, as a matter of fact, Torricelli took his barometer to different places and measured them. Now, again, I want to be clear, we're not going to be using a mercury barometer because mercury, while very fun to play with, if you have an open cut, will give you mercury poisoning, which is very unpleasant. And so, of course, your thought might be, well, make it out of water. But a water one, because water is so much less dense than mercury, it has to be 33 feet tall. And some people in the Netherlands, of course, built one of these, and I'm really jealous of it and kind of want to do it. I'm not going to lie. But it would be very expensive and very difficult. Torricelli needed mercury because mercury was able to be contained. I mean, instead of something I could basically hold in my hand, something that's like from my, my waist up to the top of my head, now it's something that's as tall as rockers. Like, these are very different scales. And, and plus the pressure would change wildly and you'd have to be like, have a ladder measure. It's not practical, but it'd be very cool. Anyway, we have to use mercury. We can't use this. So in real life, you know, we use something that looks like this, which is an anorite barometer. I don't really care about you knowing that. Just no, we don't use mercury anymore. Regardless, when Torricelli was carrying his barometer around, what he was doing 
was he was measuring the millimeters of mercury. And at sea level down here, air pressure is 760 mmHg, which means this guy here is 760 millimeters, 76 centimeters from here to here. That's really neat, actually. It works. And what he notices is he would like up the Alps and things. The pressure dropped really fast. If, if I'm going to go ahead and move myself here really fast. The pressure went from really, really, really low to really high fast. It doesn't make a line, right? It's not a linear line like this. It's not a y equals mx plus b function. It's, it's a y equals e to the power of negative k, k something, and a mess. Don't worry about the function. What I want you to do, and I've actually even drawn the graph for you already, is notice the atmospheric pressure changes with heights. And honestly, with that, all I need you to know here is that the higher away you are from sea level, the less the air there is pushing on you. And I, I can explain why very quickly. So here's a, a DEM map of, it looks like maybe, I don't know where this is, it's really cool looking. I'm not sure where this is. And down here is the ocean, up here is the mountain. And so if I am down here, there's physically more air pushing on me than when I'm at the top. That's why I like climbers climbing Everest need oxygen tanks. That's why when you're in a plane, it has to be pressurized. And anywhere along here, it changes. Actually, I can measure that anywhere on the United States by using some computer modeling for weather, which is really neat. Uh, this is a program called the HRR, which um, is a cutting-edge weather model. And you can see I actually have a map of the surface pressure, in this case in millibars, whatever. It's a meteorological unit. And you can see, oh, hey, here's the Appalachian Mountains. Here's the Rockies. You look, you can see the Mississippi Delta, and you can see... Like, uh, oh, even probably pick out like Rainier up here in the Pacific Northwest or Death Valley or whatever. You can see the heights above the ground. I can zoom in. You can see it's a really high resolution model. It's a, a proxy for how uh, hilly the ground is. So, of course, it's lower. You know, of course, the pressure in Denver is significantly different than the pressure in, let's say, LA here. No, LA here, not at the San Francisco. Anyway, that's why it's much easier to like run a marathon, let's say in, I don't know, Northern California than it is in the Mile High City because there's well, more air. Well, that's somewhat obvious. Your grade school science teacher probably told you that, but here we are. One thing to note is a common way of teaching pressure is it's the weight of the air above you. I kind of agree. It's not a great definition. So if I'm down here, and I look straight up at the sky, the, the pressure on my body is all of the molecules between my body and space. It's the weight of those molecules, effectively. It's not a great example because the gas molecules aren't all physically touching me, but whatever. If I get in my magic jet plane and I go, wee, and I come up here to this line, the ones below me don't matter. Only the things above me matter, and that's why the pressure decreases with height. Regardless, pressure does act in every or all directions. So actually, when I'm standing here in the room, and I'm out here in open space, I have air pressure pushing in on my chest, I have it pushing down on me. Those make sense. But I also have air pressure pushing up and out. Um, my lungs are full of air, which is very good. If they weren't, uh, I'll show you what happens here in a moment. But let's just say it would be very bad. What they want you to do is write down the conversions. Down here at the bottom, these are the conversions I prefer you to use. Now, on the second page, I'm asking you to write them here. On the second page, I gave you a table of conversions. Oops, weird. And they're okay, but honestly, I think these are easier to use. So here's the table I give you. This here, I think, is the more easily used. 760 millimeters of mercury. Let's use that because we know where it's coming from, from Torricelli's barometer, is equal to 760 torval. Well, that's stupid. Yeah. Agreed. But there we are. They're the same unit with different endings. One to one. That's kind of a nice start. Uh, 760 millimeters we already defined is one atmosphere. That makes sense. 760 millimeters is 101.325 Pascal. Okay, it's just a number. It's a pain in the butt, but there it is. And 14.7 PSI. This is an interesting thing. So one atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch. 14.7 pounds. PSI. I struggle with what that number looks like, and when I was in college, a professor asked me uh, exactly what 14.7 PSI represented, and actually this is what we came up with as an, an example to, to help our uh, undergraduate students understand. 14.7 PSI 
a square inch is about the size of your eye, right? So like one eye, like this area here, this is surprisingly difficult to do in the mirror, but here we go, whatever. The area of one of my eyes, that is one square inch, which means the air, if I look up, the air pushing down on my eye is equal to eh, about 15 pounds. That's kind of insane. Right now, there's 15 pounds pushing down on my eye, 15 pounds pushing down on my cheeks, 15 pounds per square inch pushing down on my shoulders, on my hair, everywhere on me, there's 15 pounds per square inch. If you start to calculate the, the pressure per, you know, like, your whole body, it's insane until you remember that there's equal pressure pushing down and it's actually equal to zero net, but, you know, total, it's massive. Um, it's so massive, in fact, that it can crush things really well. Uh, if I take all the air out of your body and I leave you at sea level, well, that's what's happening in these steel containers, which are much stronger than your body. It'll crunch them. And, you know, I, I got interested in the, the tank car here. This is a famous example. The Mythbusters try to do it, and a few others have too. This is the best one I've seen, though. And it turns out that the force on this is kind of equal to the entire population of Sedalia, Missouri, standing on top of it at once, or something like crunching it with the Saturn V booster. <laughs> it's massive. Um, basically, that, that car has like 3 million pounds waiting on it. It's insane. Okay, well, your body's not 3 million pounds. It's actually not that far off. Now, if this feels kind of like we're tangent to, but Mr. Nick, I'm not even going to give me homework on this. You're right. Um, what I want to work with on here is, uh, hopefully I can put a pen on here. Nope, okay, we'll do it on the board. Is making conversions. And conversions are really easy because you've been doing them all year in chemistry already. So on the back of your sheet, I've given you some space to do conversions. They're here. One, two, three, four. And what I want to do ultimately is talk about how to make conversions. These conversions are actually really easy. You've been doing conversions all year long in chemistry, so it's kind of an old skill. But I need you to practice it because all my gas law stuff that we're going to do when I come back is going to really depend on being able to convert between values. And I've given you a lot of practice on it. I'm going to give you a warning that you don't want to just use a, a Google Translator on it, like where you just type in the number and it gives you a number back. It's, it's not going to help you. It ask you to show your work. This is a chemistry class. So the first question I ask is, Denver doesn't have a lot of air. It's at 626 millimeters of mercury. And I want to know how many atmospheres that is. And so here I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit and make me a little bigger. And so what we have to do is I know that I have 626 millimeters of mercury. 626 mmHg. And I want to turn that into atmospheres. Now, there are a lot of different ways to do it. I think the easiest way to do this problem is honestly to just address it like you'd be addressing a stoic problem. I've got 626 mmHg, so that's got to go out front. I need mmHg to go away, so I'm going to put it on the bottom, and I want to turn it into, let's see, it says atmospheres. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my conversion table that I've already written up on the front here, and look if I have anything that converts me. And I, I see 760 mmHg is equal to one atmosphere. So in one atmosphere, there's 760 mmHg. That's neat. It's pretty easy. And I have a calculator here, so I'm going to take 1 divided by 760 and multiply that number times 626, and I get 0.823. And so my answer here is 0 0.823 atmospheres. Now, that ain't too bad. I think this makes sense to most people because, let's face it, we've been doing conversions. There's a lot of different ways of doing these problems, and I'm not going to tell you, oh, Mr. Knight, you can just divide by 760. That's fine. Do it. But show me how you get there. This is the way I'm going to teach it, though, because it's the way you've been doing it. While we're here on the back sheet, if you need to pause me and get this down, do. I want to work here. One, five, one, nine, whatever pascals is how many tor. Okay. So let's knock that out really fast. I have a big number, specifically 151987. Yeah. Yeah. 151987 pascal. I want to turn it to tor. Okay. 
Well, let's see. I've got 151987 one, Pascal. I gotta get rid of Pascal. So let's see. I I on my sheet there, I see that. Uh, well, I need to know how many Pascal are in an atmosphere. 101325. That's a weird number, but okay. 101325. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I know, you know, I know it's in 760 mmHg. I know that. Now, that's not what I'm asking for in this case, but I, I know I can get rid of mmHg if I turn it into way the Tor is an mmHg. Yeah, okay, this is a bit redundant. I don't think anyone's really going to set it up this way. But it works. Look, I mean, Pascal's cancel, MMHG cancels, Tor's left before. It's going to give me the right number, but ultimately I'm just going to divide by um, 760 here. And so, boo, 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 looks like I need to take uh, 151987 one, divided by 101, 325. Multiply that number by 760, and I get 1,140. 1,144. And again, you're just going to set up these conversion sentences. I know this is kind of painful. I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh, this is super easy. Eh, you know, it's, it's taking some rust off. But once you get the hang of it, it's easy. Now, once you get the hang of it, how do you know if you're doing it right? Well, that's where the Google conversion factors come into turn. You can quickly Google this and check 101987PA to Tor. As a matter of fact, maybe we should do that. So here, let's make me smaller again. Ooh. Honey, I shrunk an index. Okay. And let's see. 151987 Pascal to Tor. And here we go, 11399.9. And we got 1140. Hey, look at that. We're as good as Google, but able to do it ourselves. All right, now we've done those examples. We've talked about this. The only other thing we have to do is quickly talk about temperatures. And frankly, my hope is that you've already done temperatures enough times that I don't really have to talk about this because let's be honest, converting temperatures kind of sucks. That being said, temperatures really matter. And Frankly, Kelvin and centigrade, Celsius, whatever you want to call them, are both pretty bad. Okay, so we've got like degrees freedom and degrees science, but really what we're after is degrees Kelvin. And actually not degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. It's an absolute scale, so there's no actual like degrees Kelvin. It's just K. You notice there's like degrees F, degrees uh, C, and then K. Well, K actually makes it more useful. All right, our conversions are 9 fifths times C plus 32 equals F, 5 ninths F minus 32 equals C. Those two things you should have written down. And the big thing, the one that matters most to me, is that C plus 273 equals Kelvin. So Kelvin and centigrade are basically the same, except they have something in common, which is called absolute zero, which we'll talk about tomorrow or the day after. These conversions are easy. I agree, it's really easy to go Google uh, yeah, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. How many degrees C is that? I, I'm probably guilty of that more often than I want. And what I really want to do is just make sure we can do this in a way where we're not having to break our work routine to leave it. Now, I'll give you these conversions on a test. I don't care about you memorizing them because, let's be honest, anytime in your adult life you are going to Google them. When you're working in chemistry world, you're not going to Google them, but you're also going to want to look them up because you're like, is it 5 ninths or 9 fifths? Is it plus 32 or is it F minus? You know, I'll give you the equation. That's fine, but don't just Google it. So I want to do two more of these. I want to convert negative 25 degrees Kel or centigrade to Kelvin. And as a matter of fact, this one's actually really quite straightforward. Um, be thankful. Some of your homework is really easy. So let's see. Kelvin, not degrees Kelvin, mind you, is equal to 200... And 73 plus degrees C, so Kelvin equals 273 plus C degrees C. In this case, I gave you a minus 25. So 273 minus 25 equals 248 Kelvin. No degree symbol, just K. Now, I will know if you used a calculator online to do this instead of showing me the setup for two reasons. Because you want to show me the setup. And the constant they give you isn't quite equal to 273. Sucks. 
So do the work by hand. Otherwise, if we put a big zero on there and say, well, you didn't do anything besides Google it. Lo siento, pero okay. The other one says 212F to K. So the boiling point of water in K. That doesn't sound too terrible. Let's see. Let's run this in a not as terrible thing. So we have 212F. I'm going to go to K. And there's no direct conversion between F and K. I have to use my conversion from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, which if I look here, I can take... 5 ninths, and I can take degrees F minus 32 equals degrees C. You know, you might notice I'm actually having to look this up. That's annoying. Why am I looking this up? Because even I have to really take a look at these equations. Okay, so let's see. 5 ninths, let's see, I have 212 minus 32 equals degrees C. So let's see. 5 divided by 9 times... Let's see, 212 minus 32, close parentheses, equals 100 even, which, duh, didn't think I knew that. Well, good. You knew that 100 degrees C was the boiling point of water, which, of course, it is. I don't know why I'm even taking the time to show you this, but maybe it's a good proof that the equation works. Oh, I'm going to your thinking. No. When we're there, is 100 degrees C what I'm looking for? No, of course, I'm not trying to go to Kelvin. So Kelvin is not degree C, but, of course, I know what Kelvin is. Kelvin is just 273 plus degree C, so uh, the boiling point of water is defined as 373 Kelvin, obviously not degrees again. Don't put a degrees K, I'm going to put a little like quarter point minus, which from a frowny face every time, and it'll be like, you know, and the frowny face will get more and more animated. That's all I want you to do today. Convert. Convert temperatures, convert pressures. You have to set up these little strikes things, you have to work through them. You can check them with Google, don't do them with Google. They're attached. Now, when you turn this into me on Monday, first thing I do is I answer questions. You can do a quiz over it using these notes. So if you don't have the notes, eh, kind of up a creek. Okay, the notes here are filled out. That's three points. This is done. That's four, five points. A lot of points there. Do it. You've got a sub. You're pretty much done for the day. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about gas laws, but let's focus on this today. So you have no new homework if you finish this out. If you need help, email me. I'm at a robotics competition. Normally that means I'm bored because it's not my competition. It's my students' competition. So... Um, hopefully everything is good. By the way, your tests, if you took them on, uh, well, today, so on Monday, or are probably pretty close to graded, or on Tuesday, they'll be graded when you come back. Regardless, if you didn't take the test, it's on you to email me and say, okay, Nandik, what do I need to do next to get this done? That's, that's the goal, okay? And so if I, I need to know, like, oh, I was absent on this day, Let's figure out a way to make up the test. Um, in general, it's going to probably look like you doing it right when I come back. I don't want to really try to say anything else up. Anyway, up to that, email me questions, work this through, um, and have a great day. Bye.